Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Flo Smith, Vice President, Head of Payments at Clarion Bank, and welcome to the BDC event, the Payments in the New Normal. On behalf of Clarion Teams, we'd like to thank the EDC for inviting us to host this event and hope that you will find this session informative and inspiring. Today, we'll discuss the accelerated digitalization of payments, navigating your e-commerce journey, and how you, a business owner, can protect your, your cardholders' information and, and as well as yours. Joining us today from Clarion is Mr. Andrew Cassidy, our Vice President, Head of Commercial Banking, who will discuss our noble purpose. Now, he and his teams are navigating businesses to, sorry, how, his, how he and his teams are assisting businesses navigating their commercial needs and requirements. Mr. Ricardo Mello, our Cyber Risk Operations Manager, will discuss global security concerns and data security best practices. We are also joined by our valued commercial banking clients, Ms. Tamara Richardson, Vice President of Sales and Operations at People's Pharmacy, as well as Mr. Carl Vincent, Proprietor of Drop It Delivery. The last half hour will be an interactive session that will be open to attendees to ask questions to Clarion teams, as well as to our guests, Tamara and Carl. Our first panelist is Mr. Andrew Cassidy, our head of commercial banking, who will discuss how he and his teams are assisting business entities to navigate their financial future. Thank you, Andrew. Thanks, Flo, and thanks again to Tammy and Carl, and everyone listening today for taking the time out of your schedule to, uh, to hear what we have to say. Um, before starting, um, uh, you know, I, what we want to do is explain to you why we're so excited uh, about how we can assist local businesses. Uh, and Flo mentioned our noble purpose. So at Clarion, we're driven by our noble purpose. And so our noble purpose is to help our clients navigate their financial future. And so our goal is to become our clients' financial advisors. Uh, we want to be sound boards for them. We want to understand what they have in plans and talk to us first. Um, we want to provide our clients with products and, and tools to thrive uh, in their business. And we also want to provide our clients with access to experts uh, who can help them grow their business. Um, to ensure we are successful in helping our clients navigate their financial future, uh, there, we embrace three key behaviors, and those behaviors are first, client-driven. So we're client-driven. Anytime we come up, we have a decision that we're making, we are thinking about the client and trying to think about the client as much as possible, how it's going to impact them. Um, we also, uh, another key behavior is integrity. Honesty, trust, reliability are essential for excellent relationships. Uh, and that's not only for relationships with clients, that's with relationships with our internal colleagues as well. Uh, and the last behavior is teamwork. And so teamwork is in essential because we realize as a cohesive team, we can be much more successful and be much more impactful for our clients than going it alone. So with that being said, uh, I just wanted to give you that bit of background about who we are and why we're excited to be here and why we're excited to help you. So uh, I'll pass it on now to Ricardo and thank you again for taking the time out of your schedule to listen to us. Thank you, Andrew. And Ricardo, I'll just bring up your presentation. Sure. Uh, first of all, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, so I'll take a little time out to talk about payment security, uh, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, obviously, we've seen uh, this has changed how many small businesses have to accept payments now. So there's been a shift from physical premises to online e-commerce. And of course, there's a lot of malicious actors that are taken advantage um, through phishing emails and social engineering and, and different means um, to try and compromise, compromise victims. Um, I don't know if you remember, right in the beginning of the corona, coronavirus, uh, there were a lot of people visiting the John Hopkins site to look at the data 
on how it's spreading throughout the world and the deaths and stuff like that. That was used, uh, a lot of actors use that um, in fake emails um, to deploy viruses uh, in organizations. Um, so that was one way. Um, I think some other popular ones were um, fake emails claiming to come from the Center for Disease Control as well as, as the uh, World Health Organization. So those were a few things to, to look out for. Um, next slide, please. And of course, um, uh, when you suffer a breach, this can cause a lot of risk to, uh, to small businesses. So in March, we saw there was a 475% um, percent increase in coronavirus-related um, malicious reports. So, and even in the beginning of the pandemic, there was a, a huge rise as well. So 41% uh, of small businesses that suffered a breach paid more than 50,000 to recover. Um, it's quite an expensive cost, um, and that's just in recovery. Um, I mean, it, it could also result in fines from, from PCI if they decided you didn't take the proper steps and proper precautions to uh, protect customers' data. Um, and this could also result in termination of, of the relationship with the, with the bank depending on how severe the incident the incident was. Um, and of course, something else that, that's kind of hard to measure is reputational damage. Um, so 29% 20, of consumers surveyed said they would never again use a small business that suffered a data breach. Um, so that means you can, you can uh, lose a large amount of your customer base, which uh, will end up causing costing a lot of uh, revenue. Um, next slide, please. So here's some tips on what you can do to, uh, to protect customer data and protect um, the resources you use to deliver e-commerce to people as well as your local um, payment systems in, in your stores. So you wanna reduce where payment card data can be found. Um, you, you don't want to store card data as all, at all if you don't have to. Um, of course, merchants are offering curbside pickup and um, accepting telephone payments. So you don't want to write down um, the credit card info if you can avoid it um, rather than just entering it in the terminal right at the time while you're speaking to the customer. Um, and I mean, if you can't process it, process it at that time, I would say um, if you do write it down, make sure you shred the document immediately afterwards. You don't want to leave any traces of that around. Um, because one of the ways criminals can get things is uh, it's called dumpster diving. So even if you throw something away in the trash, it, it may not go on too much in Bermuda, to be honest with you, but but that is a way that um, people can find out information on you. Um, uh, tip two, use strong passwords. Um, so you want to change the default passwords uh, of your systems. A lot of hardware um, is often set up, I wouldn't say misconfigured or security is overlooked. So they'll use the default admin password to get in. And of course, attackers um, know this is published online. So if you use like a certain brand of router um, and you want to know what the default admin password is, it, it's easily accessible online. So that's, that's a big no-no. You definitely want to change it and use a strong password. Um, you want to um, a lot of people don't think they can use spaces and passwords, so the recommendation is, is to use a passphrase nowadays. So like a line from a movie or something, you can even put spaces in it, capitalize the first letter of each word, the last letter of each word, and then add a number and a special character, and, and that's probably one of the most 
secure passwords you can you can come up with. Um, so yeah, those are some password tips. Um, and of course, you don't want to. A lot of people also are careless. They say, "Oh, I, I I can't remember my password, so I have a password spreadsheet on their computer or something, or they keep it in a in the notes on on their um, email." So if you can't remember your passwords, and, and this is something I use regularly because I have probably over 150 passwords, is a password manager. Um, many of you would maybe have heard of 1Password or LastPass. Those are the two most popular ones. They also have an app on your phone um, that you can use. And it allows you to uh, access it from your web browser, so you can you don't even have to remember passwords. It will generate a password for you, a strong one, and then you basically can just enter it in the web form as soon as you sign in using your master password. So that's what I would would recommend there also. And then you also want to keep software patched and up to date. Um, so a vulnerability is a weakness in the system um, that a, an attacker, attacker will look to exploit. Um, so if there aren't many vulnerabilities, there aren't many ways um, for the attacker to exploit anything. Um, and you wanna make sure you have a regular patching schedule. So if you use Windows or Mac OS, maybe every week at a certain time, make sure you check and install updates. So you want to keep your systems up to date as, as possible. Um, uh, uh, vulnerability scans also. Um, PCI has a list of recommended um, scanning vendors that you can use to scan your internet face and payment systems. So um, to make sure you don't have anything accessible on the internet that shouldn't be. Um, you ideally want to have your payment terminals um, behind a firewall and inaccessible from, from outside, um, except for the case of remote access, but I'll, I'll touch on that a little bit later. Um, so yeah, that, that's also a, an important um, part of uh, keeping things up to date. Uh, next slide, please. Using strong encryption. Um, if you use vendors that are known and that are PCI compliant, then they would definitely use uh, strong encryption. So um, this is used to protect the, the data as it transmits over the car network, whether it's locally using um, a card processing machine or or online um, using a shopping cart or a payment gateway um, it's a good idea to ask questions um, for vendors so whether the in, whether the um, encryption uses point-to-point -point encryption which is basically end-to-end -end, um, and make sure they're on the PCI's list of validated uh, solutions. And also just to go a little bit into point to point, a lot of the older websites used to use what's called SSL, is a secure sockets layer. And that's no longer um, being approved because it's, it's not secure anymore. So the new standard is TLS. Um, and version 1.2 is the latest stable version. So I think most of your processes would be using that, that as well, but it is good to, to ask these questions. Um, use secure remote access. So make sure you use multi-factor authentication when allowing access to the network, strong password, as I mentioned. Um, if the remote access is for a vendor. Um, make sure your firewall is configured just to allow that vendor's IP address. So basically that means they can only remote into your systems from their company. So anybody else outside of their company wouldn't be allowed 
to have have access. Um, and yeah, you you basically yeah I mentioned you limit that through firewalls. You use strong credentials. Uh, you want to ensure that firewalls are configured properly. Um, so a firewall is a device mostly or software that sits between your network and the internet so it acts as a barrier to keep out your to keep out network and systems that you don't want access um, into your network so sometimes they they are complex and i know some people are tech savvy but i i don't recommend you trying to configure that yourself i know Small businesses have limited resources and a lot don't have a full IT person, but it's best to get one of the IT consultant companies to, to make sure they do it right for you. Um, Cause that, that is a vital step because a, a mis misconfiguration could, you know, allow access easily to your network. Um, uh, next slide, please. So yes, think be think before you click. Um, sure, we've all heard of phishing and social engineering, but I'll just uh, give a brief description. So phishing is when a malicious actor sends an email to you, usually um, claiming to be someone else or, or trying to fake somebody's email address. And it usually contains a link to try and get you to take an action. Um, one of the popular ones is recently during the pandemic when Microsoft Teams was made available free for six months. Um, a lot of people took advantage of that and just configured it. Of course, uh, it didn't set up multi-factor authentication. Um, so what that means is somebody, uh, an actor would send an email, a phishing email, with a link that looked like Microsoft Office 365 login, it would have some background to it, like, oh, you need to update your password. Um, the link will redirect you to a fake site. You would put in your real credentials. It would capture those credentials. Then the attacker has your login and password. He would then log in as you, um, Compromise your account, have access to your OneDrive, your Teams, your email. So then that's what no, that's what's known as business email compromise. So now the phishing emails are gonna come from people you actually know. So they get through mail filters very easily because the, the persons are often on permitted lists or or they're allowed because they're known. So that, that's one of the big things that, that went on um, during the pandemic and, and still going on right now. So yeah, multi-factor authentication is use uh, Office 365, you must have that. I've seen it in Bermuda a lot, a lot recently. Um, I'll, I'll chime in and just say that I, I got one today from uh, a logic.bm account uh, telling me to clear my account, but I don't even have an account. So it definitely does happen. Yeah, for sure, for sure. And of course, social engineering, I'll give you an example of that is when, um, say somebody calls you claiming to be from Microsoft and they detected that your computer is out of date or needs an urgent security patch. And then they say, okay, they get you to install a remote access tool that gives them access to your computer, basically. So then they just have full control over your computer after that. Um, that, that was a popular scam as well. Um, there's also different variations like smishing, which is basically basically phishing over SMS, uh, text messages, and vishing, which is like voicemail scams um, using voicemail. But yeah, loads of different different stuff like that. So the best thing to do when getting emails and you're not sure, you're not expecting them, is if you just hover your mouse over the link, it shows you where it actually goes. And if the domain, which is uh, the say the word that comes with before .com or .net, so Microsoft.com, .net, um, Facebook.com. So if you look for that end part and it doesn't match up with the link, you should be very suspicious of it. And 
of course, if you're not expecting anything to change your password or stuff like that, I would just delete the email. Because if you can't access your account, then then you know something's wrong. Um, so yeah, those, those are some things uh, to look out for. And then the final tip is choose trusted partners. Um, so it's critical to know who your service providers are and what questions to ask them. Um, are they adhering to PCI DSS? Um, what I didn't mention earlier was there are fines. There, I think the fines are from 5,000 to 100,000, I want to say, a month. You and are so correct. Yeah. Recorded. Yes, the maximum. average cost of a data breach in the U.S. Um, based on um, global trends is a hundred thousand dollars for a small business. Yeah, exactly. So it can be detrimental to your to your business if you aren't following these uh, these requirements. Um, so yeah, that's another important thing: PCI DSS. And there's twelve things that you need to um, to adhere to when it comes to PCI. Let me see if I could just list those. I think I've covered most of them in this in this webinar. So the first requirement requirement is install and main, install and maintain a firewall configuration to protect Cardo data. Do not use vendor supplied defaults for system passwords and other security parameters. Protect stored Cardo data. Encrypt transmission of cardhold data across open public networks. Protect all systems against malware and regularly update antivirus software programs. Develop and maintain secure systems and applications. Restrict access to cardhold data by business need to know. Uh, identify and authenticate access to system components. Uh, restrict physical access to cardhold data. Track and monitor all access to network resources and cardhold data. Um, regularly test security systems and processes. And the final one is maintain a policy that addresses information security for all personnel. And that concludes my part of the presentation. I hope you all enjoyed. And I did share a PDF um overview uh, of the information i just provided as well thank you so much uh, ricardo um can you explain to our audience the difference between um, a vulnerability and a penetration scan since the adoption of emv and contactless fraud breaches have shifted to e-commerce so how can small business owners protect their website security uh, so you want me just to explain um, the difference between vulnerability tests and a penetration test? Correct, yes. Okay. So a vulnerability assessment would be um, basically to, ex to explain what weaknesses um, are in your systems, are, are found in your systems when the scan is done. And a penetration test would, is basically an ethical hacker who's actually trying to exploit vulnerabilities and um, basically seeing what access they can gain to the system. So it goes a little further than a vulnerability assessment. It's actually somebody trying to gain access to your networks um, to say, okay, you need to fix this, you need to fix that. Maybe you need to um, change this. You need to disable these outdated versions. So a vulnerability scan just gives you the information and the penetration test goes, goes further than that. Thank you, Ricardo. And can you explain to our audience um, just a generalized view of PCI? Um, okay. And you mentioned there's, there's six steps, correct? Oh, I just went through the 12. The, that okay. was the last part, the, okay, the yeah. 12 requirements, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much, Ricardo. You're welcome. So next, we're going to talk about the acceleration of digitalization of payments. We can refer to COVID-19 as the digitalization accelerator simply because it inspired governments, banks, 
This is the Accelerate Their Innovation Landscape Agenda. Consumers in Bermuda had to quickly shift to digital services and businesses that were using traditional point of sale environments had to migrate to e-commerce, mobile and contactless enabled payments. We saw a significant peak and spike, I should say, in merchants wanting e-commerce due to the shelter in place that occurred last April, as well as our current uh, stay at home policy uh, that's been invoked by government. We saw also significant increase in contactless acceptance in Bermuda. And we've seen consumers prefer to use their credit or debit card rather than cash because of fear of contaminants on dollars and coinage. As of March 2021, contactless acquiring transaction penetration in Bermuda is at 50.8%. Bermuda is in the top five for contactless transactions in the LAC region, which is quite significant because the LAC region can, um, encompasses the Caribbean community as well as Mexico and Brazil. So it really shows you how robust our digital foundation is in Bermuda. Reviewing some global statistics, it shows that evolving shopping expectations prioritize convenience and discovery. 66% of online purchases, purchasers choose a retailer based on convenience, while only 47% choose a retailer based on price and value. So that says a lot about how consumers' uh, purchase uh, trends are, are changing rapidly. So if you do have an e-commerce site, it's important that you have that adapted that payment functionality um, because you only have a few, you know, customers are only on that site for a few seconds before they determine whether they want to make a purchase from your company. Um, consumers also spent in US trending 861 billion online with US retailers in 2020, which was up 44%. And that's in line with Amazon, e commerce giant, uh, second quarter 2020 numbers reported 40% growth year over year. So it just definitely shows, based on the global trends, that e commerce is a critical um, acceptance channel for your customers. There are five payment trends transforming commerce. Um, we mentioned contactless payments, and that involves the ability of your plastic that's been issued by your bank to communicate with your with the point of sale terminal at the at your merchant location. We've also seen omni-channel commerce, and we've seen this a lot last year, as well as this week in particular, where we're, merchants are looking for one software solution to accommodate online payments, physical store acceptance, and mobile payments. And this is helping providing customers with options for payments. We've also seen digital wallets acceptance, uh, Apple Pay, Samsung, Google Pay, and this involves the digital cards being uploaded to your smart device and having the ability to pay at a merchant location. And fintech, merging of non-financial service provider with the financial services. And how can FIATs, traditional financial institutions, leverage the already existing and created bespoke solutions and artificial intelligence to enable card acceptance? So these are the trends that we are seeing, and Clarion teams are working on these particular environments to, to accommodate business requirements. Embarking on your e-commerce journey. Well, if you're an e-commerce client, if, if you're an e-commerce merchant, website development is critical. It's important that you have that added payment functionality. As mentioned before in the previous slide, customers within seconds will make a decision whether they would like to make a purchase from your business or not. It's also good to choose a developer that you has a vision that you have provided the specifications to so that you are fully functional and they also complete the integration of the gateway. And a gateway vendor. There are two primary um, gateways that our clients are using. One of them is First Atlantic Commerce and the other is Authorized.net. 
Now it's important, there's a lot of gateways um, internationally that uh, merchants may decide to use. However, it's important that that gateway can actually work with your website and be compatible with the local banks in Bermuda. As a merchant, you'll also require a commercial bank account. And this involves the operating account that our commercial teams can assist you with. So this is for any of your merchant net deposits, your operating, your, your deposits, and your withdrawals. A merchant account is separate, and that is an account that we set up as an acquirer that will enable you to accept payments. So the overall application process at Clarion is as follows. There's additional paperwork for corporate as well as merchant account opening. We require all clients to have a business case, and this usually includes financial statements one to two years if possible. And basically just let us know what your, your, your annual volumes are, um, your projected sales, um, and that will provide us with some idea on how we can best navigate your commercial needs and requirements. We also request, require, sorry, existing merchant processing statements showing chargebacks, returns, and current pricing structure if available. Now, if you're a new merchant, we, projections are fine. Um, we just need to know some idea on how we can competitively, or sorry, can provide you with a competitive and comprehensive pricing schedule. Determine anticipated, anticipated volume by reviewing previous monthly um, history and that's any transactions that have been processed through your payment channel. Last but not least, we have our website terms and conditions. As you're an e-commerce client, you do not have a brick and mortar. So it's important that you not only outline your privacy or property terms and conditions, but also what your sales or refund policies are, whether your products are going to have to be shipped to Bermuda and then delivered to your customers. So the terms and conditions are extremely important. For merchant pricing at Clearing, we'll require an average ticket of each product or service, uh, annual MasterCard Visa and American Express volumes if you're an existing operating entity. Now, if you're a new entity, of course, it'll be based on estimates and, and your projections that are outlined in the business case. Another, another information that's required is customer segments, whether your most of your customers are corporate, premier, or standard. This is key because when we price you, we have to take that into consider, sorry, we have to take that into consideration as well. Whether your clients are international versus domestic, are your cards, are your customers mostly international or locally based? And of course, what type of payment solution are you using? POS, e-commerce, or both. Um, for pricing, I just wanted to provide just a recap of how we actually price it. And we get a lot of questions from, from business owners to say, do we really need to have the additional payment solution? And I say, you cannot afford not to have a solution. Um, and the breakdown just encompasses um, the bank fees, estimated bank fees based on an average ticket of 100. So we have bank charges, um, you could take an average of 3.75% plus additional 10 cent per transaction. So if we take that $100, um, your net deposit will be $96.15. This excludes any setup and monthly support fees as well as the gateway charges that your vendor will assess. Okay, and that concludes my presentation. And I would like to introduce you to Tamara and Carl. Thank Hello. you for joining us today. I know it's been extremely busy, especially um, during the stay at home this week. So we truly appreciate um, your efforts to assist local um, business and local residents, I should say, um, with their, um, their required the pharmaceutical and online grocery store uh, deliveries as well. So Tamara and Carl, can you share with the audience how you and your teams were able to meet the needs 
of clients when brick and mortar businesses shut down last year and how your teams are able to manage the current stay at home policy. Hey Tamara, I'll let you go first if you'd like. Okay, sure. Thanks, Carl, and good afternoon to everyone. Um, as an entrepreneur, I approach um, all new ventures um, the same way we approach starting the business. Um, I would advise anyone to um, know your customer, figure out who your customer is and what, what problems you're solving. Once you know what problem you're trying to solve, um, then that that becomes um, the business you're in. So for People's Pharmacy, um, actually for all of Bermuda, the same problem we had to solve during lockdown was how do we get our goods um, to people, especially the essential needs. Uh, we didn't have a choice. We had to pivot uh, very much overnight. However, when things did calm down around about um, the summertime, we actually did have to go back um, and improve our online offering. We had to expand the amount of products uh, we had online. So it was quite a scramble in the beginning to just get online, um, but then we were able to really, I would say really pivot and focus on our online business as a separate um, business. Um, we had to manage um, the various technical abilities of our customer. Uh, so we do have to manage that sort of omni-channel uh, customers wanting to call in, customers wanting to be on a mobile dev device versus um, at a PC. Uh, so it is quite a process um, to make sure you're meeting all the needs um, of your customer because your website is essentially your, your customer service tool. Um, you have very few seconds to... Uh, give your customer what they need online, so you, you can't afford um, to get that wrong. At the same time, our staff also had to adapt. Um, many of them had varying levels of technical ability, so it was very important for us to uh, give people a crash course on managing databases, getting um, transactions into some form so that the warehouse could pick them. Um, so these are just some of the things you have to think through uh, before you just go online, especially if you have, um, you know, widgets that you're selling versus a service. Um, just some key things that I like to um, use as our mantra at People's, we under promise so that we can over deliver. Um, it's impossible for you to order in the morning and for People's to have it show up at your door at night. So we try to um, be very realistic about our delivery windows. Um, Going through your slides, I'm sure people are starting to see that for every dollar sale you make online, it will cost you. So you, well, people's really had to determine what products were worth it to sell online. Um, obviously, prescriptions being our highest margin item, it's essential that those are available online. Um, and our, our prescription delivery business pretty much makes us being online worth it. Um, we also have to deal with the peaks and valleys of the demand online. Um, on Monday, we probably did more business online that we, than we had done for the previous uh, four weeks. At Christmas, we probably did more business online than we had done for the previous uh, month or so. So the Bermudian customer wants the Amazon experience, but when they're not on lockdown, they don't seem to, mm -hmm. they, don't, they seem to want to come into the store versus online. That's been our experience in the last year. And Tamara, for local residents, are they able to go online? Are you delivering um, pharmaceutical purchases as well as retail as well? Yes, so www.peoples.bm, we add more products um, every day. Uh, prescriptions are delivered free of charge. Uh, the other goods, I believe there's a minimum purchase amount and then we will deliver. Um, and delivery is based on um, the area of the island you live in. So on Tuesdays and Fridays, I believe we deliver to the east, Mondays and Thursdays to the west. Don't quote me on that, but <laughs> yeah, we have a delivery schedule set up um, so that our team can manage it because they still have to manage in-store mm -hmm. expectations as well. And Carl? Hello, everybody. I'm Carl from Drop It. Uh, 
Well, for one, I want to say, uh, Tamara, I'm, I'm esteemed to speak with you uh, in such an established business. Uh, you know, I, I've been going there since I was a kid, and now I have a business, so it's quite cool. Um, so I guess in regards to our online business and COVID in the last year, uh, it's been nuts. Um, it's been awesome, but yeah, there's certainly things that you don't, um, that you wouldn't cons wouldn't have considered from the beginning or expected with you know, um, COVID really increasing online sales. Um, but I would say how we adapted, we, well, for one, we had to kind of, our business was 100% online and then all of a sudden it became one of the only options for everybody. So there we were, you know, Flo, remember at the beginning, you know, hey, okay, we wanna, you know, do maybe 50 deliveries a day and, and we'll work towards that. And then all of a sudden it was like, oh my gosh, um, you know, we got to crank out 150 deliveries today for the next six or seven weeks. You know, what do we do? Um, and my advice to anybody who's starting a business online uh, would be to build it, build it so that it's scalable immediately. Because uh, we ran into the problem where, like I said, we, we, were, we were expecting, oh, maybe 50 orders a day. And then all of a sudden, we needed to do 150, which means our site needed to be three times as fast and hold three times as many people. And the site was crashing and all that sort of stuff um, just because we weren't prepared or the environment wasn't prepared to scale as necessary. Um, and then in regards to staffing and uh, quality control and all that, it's, it's, a, it's a continuous challenge. Um, we certainly have our procedures in place now and we, we, we have more practice this time than we did last time and over the course of the time. Um, but yeah, and in regards to with the banking partners, there was um, Clarion, so we bank Clarion personally and with the business. And um, during those times where we were like, oh my gosh, we need to, you know, we, we need to speak with the bank because we need a little help here or there. And, you know, Flo and Andrew and the other, and Connor, the rest of the team were, most of the time willing to help us no i'm kidding all the time they're willing to help and uh, and and yeah we're, we're we're very thankful for that um but the, yeah the journey continues you know I, we wouldn't have expected a year almost exactly to be in the same sort of lockdown situation which we are and i guess we're somewhat ready this time and carl uh drop it is purely e-commerce um at the beginning of um, your business journey um did you just look at the e-commerce versus app opportunity? Um, what factors did you take into consideration to just be an e-commerce site? Um, yeah, so th this was a this was a big question from the beginning. Build an app, build a website. Um, you know, and it, you you don't do one or the other. Some people can do both. It depends on you know what what the financial situation is like at the beginning. Uh, but with the website, we found that we could be a bit more experimental and um, go live sooner than we could if we had built an app. Um, and because we were kind of uh, experimenting the whole way through the build and still are, um, with a website, I can you know click submit on my change today or right now and see it live on my website you know a couple minutes later. Uh, where with an app, it's a bit more of a process and you know a bit more uh, resource uses a bit more resources. Um, yeah. I don't know and if I answered all the questions then, sorry. <laughs> um, can you share your corporate and merchant account setup experience and journey with Clarion Teams? Yeah, certainly. Start with uh, Carl. No, oh, sorry, sorry, Tamara. Um, then for Tamara. Uh, let's see. So we, I have, I've always had a personal account with Clarion. Um, I also had one with another bank, and um, and then going to start the business, you kind of put your feelers out there, and whoever gets back to you first is kind of who gets your attention. Um, especially in in this day and age, where it seems to be quite the difference in response times. Um, so long story short, uh, we connected with Connor um, and I think Clarion was also hosting an in-person event that may have been similar to this uh, that we went to and got to, you know, shake hands and, and, and see smiling faces. And um, yeah, then, then we started our, our uh, commercial banking experience from then. Um, it was quite cool, actually. Connor uh, delivered the, um, the banking application to our office at the BBC because 
we, we were supposed to meet and we forgot. Long story short, he just was, yeah, kind enough to bring the papers and got the process started. It was quick and sweet. And yeah, here we are. And Tara. Yeah, um, I would definitely say that um, because of the size of peoples, we definitely rely on trusted experts. And Clarion was our trusted expert when it came to um, getting us started. We had looked into um, the merchant sorry, the online merchant setup prior to COVID um, because of our hospital business. So we did we did sort of have a head start um, in that respect. Uh, but yeah, last year, very quickly, thank goodness, we had that personal touch from Clarion um, to walk us through what was a gateway, what were our options, what were the best, um, what was the best choice? Um, because literally overnight we had to go online. So, um, I definitely have a huge team who would probably be better able to answer. So for a business that's a team of one, I can definitely say Clarion uh, would be an excellent partner because like Carl said, they do answer the phone when you call. <laughs> yeah, agreed, agreed. And I know how to find Andrew no matter what's going wrong. <laughs> <laughs> And when starting and managing important uh, things to consider first when starting uh, a business and specifically setting up an online presence. So what are those considerations when you're starting an e-commerce entity? Um, I would say to yeah, understand, understand the numbers, understand how your business is uh, going to make money. Um, some things that we didn't necessarily pay close attention to at the beginning was uh, Slow's last slide there that was up, which shows you know the 3.75 percent, um, you know, just a little, just a little charges that you kind of don't mix into the business plan, um, which ultimately you know come down to and become important numbers, uh, you know, when you finally set up and you're looking at oh, okay, well yeah, they're, they're, you know, how how does this work? Uh, but just yeah, try to get as clear a picture as possible um, of your business uh, beforehand, so then you don't get stuck and lost in the sauce midway um understand what the payment gateway options are like flo said there's two um, um authorized.net which is resold through fireminds i believe and um fac First atlantic commerce um a lot of people who have asked me about e-commerce in the past have said hey i uh, i'm just gonna get a shopify site and use paypal um, because they accept Stripe and I'm just going to send my money to, you know, my American account or into my PayPal account and blah, blah, blah. It seems easier than going to set up a bank account. Um, but when you look at the percentages and stuff that you lose when you try to transfer that money here to use it mm -hmm. and just the, the sheer headache alone, um, it's not worth it. You end up losing more money, but maybe for you, you can justify the time. I don't know. It's it's easier to just set it up right the first way. Um, and with our authorized.net setup, I can, you know, take charges on my phone um, using our payment gateway. If I'm just out, you know, I can I can swipe someone's card. And although that's not for the website, but it's using the same payment gateway. So it's just little things that you kind of find out along the way that are beneficial. And what else I got? Go ahead. I'll let you go, Tamara. Um, I, well, I would just say I believe in making a business case for everything, um, making sure you have a team. And if that team is a team of one, then just make sure your time is worth it. Um, Peoples, when we launched our website, we needed a marketing team. We needed an admin team. We needed um, customer service to manage people's expectations. We needed IT and technology to make sure we were PCI compliant and everything was secure. Um, and then that's not even including the, the team that's required to get the products into Bermuda and into our customers' homes. So um, your time definitely um, has a value. So make sure when you're looking at um, launching that you take all of that into consideration. Um, when you look at the charges related to processing online or using credit cards, period, if you're selling one item at $1,000, versus a thousand items at one dollar, it's going to matter because there's a per transaction charge. So definitely think through everything, um, talk to people who have done it before, and make sure you have your ducks in a row before you go live. Because customers expect Amazon. <laughs> <They do. laughs> and that's an important note um, 
Tamara, because when you're setting up an online presence in Bermuda, you're not just keep competing with uh, local businesses, you're competing mm -hmm. with Amazon and the, and the, and the e-commerce giants internationally. So it's important. Um, we have some attendees that are smaller uh, businesses and entrepreneur, new entrepreneurs. And setting up a website, you can either have an integrated solution. And from a cost perspective approach, from a development um, cost, it can be expensive. Um, there is an alternative, and that is called the virtual terminal, which will enable merchants to be able to accept credit card payments through um, uh, their PC or smart device. So if you're an entrepreneur and you do not you know, have the investment to, to fund an integrated site, um, that, that first term will provide you with an avenue to enable your customers to pay by a card. Now, because it's more of a manual process um, and there's forms, from a PCI perspective, as Ricardo mentioned, keeping your secure, your customer's information safe is critical. So at Clarin, we can help you guide you through that, um, that um, particular option for your businesses. Can I add on to that, Flo? Certainly. So um, when we talk about security, um, it is easy. And the first thing we think about with a website is yes, hackers, cybersecurity, um, other people, not our users that are, are being the unsafe ones. So in our case, um, we have had, let's say less than five instances where security has become an issue, but it hasn't been from a, a level of someone coming in from um, America or where have you, India and, and, and hacking. It's been people using stolen credit card information from locally mm -hmm. to buy something here. So it's everything appears as normal, uh, but it's it's something that we didn't really have to consider before COVID and before you get the masses and I, oh, wow, well, okay, well, there's an idea. And, you know, we, we've had, we kind of have a little, uh, a little monitor set up that identifies weird orders, uh, meaning like uh, one, one order, for example, someone ordered five bottles of red wine, five bottles of white wine, five bottles of cockspur and everything in the frozen section. And this is just, we know what the customer's orders look like. So anyhow, um, for example, just, just giving you guys an example, um, that order, we saw it and we just held it. The, the shopper actually shopped it and I said, look, let's just not deliver this one. And let's see, you know, if this customer actually calls to say, hey, where's my order? And if they ask, then we can give it to them for free. But if we deliver the goods, we can't get them back. And, you know, we're talking like 800, 900 bucks here. Uh, long story short, uh, the next day, um, a guy called and said, hey, uh, my card has been used on Drop It. Um, I've never ordered with you guys, and I was like, "Oh my gosh!" It was, it you know, just nuts. But you just have to be. It's easy to think about the website as just some sort of cyber online space, but it's actually a building where people can rob and people can light fire to, and you have to monitor that, even when you know when, when you think it's just so comfortable. It's a website. Yeah. And to add to Carl's uh, comments, um, from a perspective of chargebacks, you know, customers can charge back for many reasons. And the terms and conditions on your website are absolutely critical. Because in the event that a cardholder does initiate a dispute with their issuer, Clarion will have to provide MasterCard and Visa with that information that you provide. So you know, information about secure terms and conditions. Did your customers have an option to agree to terms and conditions? I know, Carl, your website has that before I can even pay for groceries. Right. Um, so that acknowledges that the cardholder read the terms and conditions and that they agreed to your delivery policies and practices that are currently in place. Um, we've seen fraud cases um, and disputes increase because it's card not present. So your website, your terms and conditions are absolutely critical um, to, to the operation. We also have a dedicated team within commercial banking and acquiring and operations that also manage the dispute process uh, for our merchant community at Clarion as well. And next question, for every crisis, for, for, for every crisis there are opportunities and for every opportunity there are lessons learned. Can you share with attendees what key lessons were learned during the 12 months? Hmm. One, two, doesn't matter. 
Well, I would say I'm sure there are many other <laughs> lessons, but the main lesson we toyed around with going online for years and you know when you need to get something done in business when your when your bottom line depends on you depends on it you will get it done that was the main lesson learned um in 2020 um in 2021 i would say um stay ready <laughs> um and then our staff and myself have had to learn how to um react because you you know you're operating um with one set of beliefs and operating hours and then at a moment's notice you have to change pivot whatever the buzzword is so um be adaptable is the best thing i i can suggest and carl i would agree uh definitely with with both your points um but yeah certainly the be be, be willing to change know that whatever you your original plan is just know that you're probably going to have to veer away from it um or you know double whatever the goal was and double the work uh the second let's see my second point would probably be to focus on building a good team because you never know like you said um tamra when you're going to have to say hey guys i need you to eight tonight you know uh, uh, you know we're typically uh, let's say between five and eight i'll do during the shelter in place moment what i would typically do in a day so that the team is doing you know a lot more work than they used to and you know just yeah just build a good build a good team that's like just down you know willing to willing to to work hard and, and get things done um one more let's see um if you have more to share that's fine carl yeah um, i would say well i would say find um or find and or make use of any mentors um, or like leaning posts that you have. Uh, like I've, I think over the past year, I've leaned on way more people than I, I would have ever imagined. Um, and partially because I'm like, I wanna do this myself or, you know, I, I know I can do it, but um, yeah, you just, it, if people are willing to help you and they offer and have something that you don't have, uh, make use of it. Call the BDC, call Flow, call the bank. Um, yeah, call your friend, call your uncles, anyone who has experience, share your problems, share the story. Um, because yeah, people will have answers that you're not expecting that will lead you kind of down, down a really good path. Um, and I've got another point to make. I think that I, I would owe it to myself if I was back in those shoes before. Um, when you're coming to the bank to create this relationship as a merchant, um, your first commercial account, um, you know, when you're telling them what your business plan is, uh, you know, shoot for the stars and let them know like where your mind's at, and then they can better prepare their strategy to work with you. Uh, because otherwise you go in there and say, yeah, I'm just gonna open a little small this, then they're gonna just kind of give you a little small bit of time. And, you know, it's, it's, it's all relative to whatever your goals are. And just know that um, as you grow, your negotiating relationship with the bank or with any of your partners grows as well. So ask when you want something, you know, make those, have those conversations because you only wish you had them sooner. Well, thank you both for your advice. I would like to open up to the audience if you have any questions for the clearing teams, or invite a guest. I see one there from me. I don't know if you want me to take that. Sure. So the person asks, can they hack you just from opening a PDF, uh, opening the link or the PDF without entering any password or info, or only, only if you enter your personal info? So what I spoke before was a specific example of what's known as credential compromise. So, you know, creating the fake site, whether it be your bank, um, Office 365, and then using that link to redirect and steal your credentials. But there's many other ways um, hackers can deliver, e deliver malicious documents through phishing. Um, sometimes they're Excel spreadsheets, which have, um, macros in them which are little mini programs that that can run in the background and try try to exploit any vulnerabilities that that your system might have um pdfs as well i mean some of them some of them are set up um to target adobe um vulnerabilities so 
of course, Adobe is the most popular PDF reader, so they may have some code in the PDF that uh, exploits an, an Adobe vulnerability as well. And there's loads of other different ways to do it as well. So there's not just one way that you can get compromised. Um, but like I said, it's important to look at the warning signs. So are you expecting this email? Um, look at look at the display name of the email. It may say Microsoft Office 365, but what's the actual email address? Is it from Microsoft.com or one of the Microsoft domains? Um, a lot a lot of them just change the display name just to trick you in, into thinking it's real. Um, as I mentioned before, hover over the links to see if that domain that um, right before the .com matches the email address. Um, that's another red flag. Um, bad spelling. Obviously, uh, some a lot of these attacks come from other countries and they use Google Translate, which is not always you know, accurate. So misspellings, not proper English, especially if they're coming from it's it claiming to come from established businesses um, and there's loads of spelling mistakes and you know gra grammatical error errors that's another another um, thing to look out for so I would say um, just be on the side of caution um, and, and just to mention there are a couple things you could do to check links so one of the tools I use all the time in, in my job is called virus total so if you search online for virus total, what you can do is just highlight the link, don't click on it, highlight it, and then paste it into virus total. It will run a scan using a whole bunch of different scanners, and then it will tell you if it's been reported as phishing or there's anything malicious on the on the other end of the link. Um, you can also do that with files as well. So again, don't open the file, just you can literally drag the file from your email right into virus total and then it will scan that file for anything malicious so that's that's a little trick a uh, little information security trick um, that people can use that a lot of people don't know about thanks ricardo for that tip and can you provide us with the uh the virus total url sure. uh, i'll put it in the chat here thank you I used your little hover hover over the uh, link trick on that email just now, and uh, yeah, it's totally wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah. So, Andrew, do you have any further questions? Um, any questions for uh, Tamara, Carl? Sorry, I'm just unmuting myself. Um, no, I, I, uh, this has been a really interesting conversation, um, and uh, I think it's uh, it's definitely timely. Uh, you know, as we have a, an aspiration to be a digital bank of choice, um, and uh, I think we, you know, we uh, we certainly appreciate the uh, the kind words that both uh, Tammy and Carl mentioned. Um, it, it isn't always easy sometimes having to navigate uh, a client's financial future, but. We try and do the best we can, and we're interested in hearing more from uh, from anyone else who's looking to that journey to uh, go, um, you know, electronic and uh, e-commerce, uh, or even setting up uh, yeah, accounts with Clarion. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, so I thank I thank Carl, I thank Tammy, I definitely thank uh, Flo, Ricardo, um, and everyone listening. So thank you for your time. Thanks, Andrew, and. Uh and the audience, again, if you'd like to just put in your chat your questions, comments to either Clarion Teams or Tamara or Carl. I've got one more point I could make. Um, Thank you, Carl. Where's my... Uh, okay, so yeah. Um, one, one other big part of, of creating a business online is you automatically think that you're providing convenience immediately and it's so much better than going into the store. And although it may be convenient um, most times, uh, convenience, what we've learned, never ends. Um, so whether whether you're 20 clicks away from you know having that shampoo or groceries at your door, 
if you can make it 10 clicks, make it 10 clicks. If you can make it five or one, because people, you know, uh, we, we sit and watch um, uh, like some, maybe like once or twice a month, we can watch a user's, uh, the just the patterns of how they shop. And then you're like, oh man, why does, you know, I didn't know someone would click that button five times, you know, can't they, don't they just know they can do this? But, you know, we know the site and you as the builder of the business will know your business, but it's important that your business works, uh, like Tamara said earlier, for the customer, um, you know, and, 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 and changes to make their, um, their experience better and easier and quicker and faster. And that's just going to continue to continue and, you know, convenience never ends. Yeah. And I, I would just add the value of um, marketing. Um, you're going to invest heavily to get online. Um, so you need to make sure you show up where your customers are, that they can find you, um, that they know they're there. If when they first logged on, their experience wasn't as great, you have to tell them when that experience is now better. Um, mm. So don't undervalue the importance of telling your story over and over, um, but make sure you show up where your customers are, which goes back to my original point of knowing who your customer is. Gotcha. Um, that's extremely important. You can assume all day long, but you need to do the work um, in figuring out whose problems you're solving. Great. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, it's important that you also understand what the customer journey is going to be because first impressions are everything. So if you're launching a new website, a new business that's purely e-commerce platform, and just takes one bad instance, one bad first impression, and the likelihood of that consumer going back to your web store is very um, unlikely. Yeah, right down to the loading time, right? If you log okay. onto a site, it takes too long to load on your phone, they're moving on. So um, just yeah. remember you're operating at internet speeds. <laughs> so mm -hmm. Making it pretty isn't always the best thing if it takes too long to load on a, on a mobile device. Indeed. Yeah. Great advice. Yeah. And so, Tammy, real quick, um, I because I find, uh, you know, for your business, you have a shop that you can actually walk through. And I know, you know, part of the whole retail experience is you kind of, you know, I, I always go in for one thing and I end up leaving with 10. And so, uh, and, you know, Carl, same thing with you. I guess, you know, if I go into a grocery store, I, I go in for one thing and come out with 10 as well. How do you how do you encourage uh, that on a website? Like, how do you market those types of? Are there any uh, best practices or tips that uh, you can offer? So, so for us, um, essentially, when you're buying online, you're buying a personal shopper. Our our team contacts the customer um, before their purchase is closed out, and I would mm. say. 70% of the online transactions end up also doing an additional transaction um, over the phone uh, because there were just other items people need. Um, but when we're not in shelter in place, partially because people haven't been able to travel, they come into people's pharmacy for retail therapy. So we haven't really <laughs> had a problem. We haven't really had a problem of the online presence taking away from the in-store presence. Um, if anything, okay. Once we're out of shelter in place, our online sort of drops off outside of, you know, the elderly and the immune compromised who have no choice. Mm. Gotcha. Yeah, and I, I would say, um, Andrew, like some of the simple features of having a website, which is like when I click the milk, it shows me the related products like, oh, look at those other milks or and you can kind of set it up. Um, and they can pick up the trends of what people purchase with what, you know, you're on Amazon. Oh, because you looked at this, check this out. Um, those sort of things play in the background as well. Uh, but online shoppers are different. Like I say, pe people that shop online um, outside of a shelter in place or a stay at home order are different types of shoppers. Uh, I would, I mean, I don't want anyone to knock me for this, but I would say that they're maybe more organized or just have, more time to at least make that list and to go uh, like from the start um so yeah it's definitely it's definitely different and I, I i would be interested to see how um you know how that impacts the the flow in the store versus online but yeah it, it's okay. not too bad 
Okay, oh, great. Thanks for that feedback. So I guess it is really important as well when clients are looking at the website that they're going to use or the package that they're going to use to make sure that it does provide some sort of analytics as well, uh, which would be very important to help help them understand what people are looking at when they're on a website as well. Right, exactly. I will, the website is essentially imagine seeing every item in the grocery store in front of you at one point in, in, in one moment or not even everything there, you know, it's hidden behind many fences. So you gotta try to figure out how to get the right stuff, you know, to the front. Otherwise, yeah. I forget. Yeah, exactly. Great. Thanks for that. Okay. We have some questions coming through. One of the questions regarding the virtual terminal, you mentioned it's manual. Please describe the process. I offer services and we're offering training online. Is this something I would use or is it more for people who are selling products? And that's a very good question. So the virtual terminal is a portal, it's web-based, so it's browser. Um, your merchant bank will set up a login specific for your merchant entity. So rather than go through the investment of web development, design, and payment integration for cardholder activation, cardholder activated payments, it's actually the merchant owner that will put that payment through the virtual terminal. So you're given a unique user ID, you're given a password, and you log into the portal, the virtual terminal, and from there you can input the cardholder's information. Now it's manual to the effect that you're going to have to develop your payment form, and we can certainly you know, provide you with some guidance on that, but usually that's a PDF document that outlines the cardholder name, um, the, the card information and expiration date um, and address as well. So as Ricardo mentioned with data security, there are risks because now you are going to hold that personal data um, at your business. So um, from that perspective, um, it's a very cost effective tool. Your gateway vendor will have their own proprietary um, pricing but then you have those forms that are, you know, at your office location or at home. So, you know, in the in the event, you know, who has access to that information? Um, in the event of a breach, that's that's critical. But that is an option for um, new entrepreneurs to utilize in order to accept payments and um, be able to invest in the future in a fully integrated website. I've got a question for you, Flo. Um, sure. So, like I was saying, um, so through Authorize.net, you we have our merchant services or the payment gateway, right? So, and then so what I did was through Authorize.net, um, they have um, they sell their own uh, physical equipment. So I just like the little um, you know keypad thing that you have to get into your bank account. Um, I got one of those that yeah. um, syncs with my phone. And like I said, I can just run swipe or tap or um, do credit cards from, from this handheld device and it just processes it using my phone signal as if it was an online transaction. Mm -hmm. I've, I've never really considered, like someone could run a, someone could run a ice cream stand on the side of the road using that technology, couldn't they? Correct. Yes, we do have um, other channels that we that our merchant community utilize, especially for mobile payments. So okay. we do have um, a reader that can be attached to um, a, a person's smartphone, which enables them to in accept credit and debit card payments from their customers. Gotcha. So we set up the merchant account. We have a vendor that we work with in the U.S. That that particular um, piece of equipment is actually magnetic stripe or EMB chips, I should say, um, contact with stripe can be attached to their mobile phone to make payments. And we're seeing a lot of that with our with all the taxis, taxi mm, operators sure. are utilizing that, um, yeah. as well as um, mobile clients. Perfect. And there's one question. Good afternoon. How would I go about setting up Authorize.net once I've opened my Clarion Merchant account? Okay, that's a good question. Um, we have several resellers in Bermuda 
that um, can provide you with um, authorized.net setup. Again, once the merchant account set up, the gateway application form and pricing is separate and proprietary. We have Firemines, um, which Carl mentioned is a reseller. We also have Ms. Simone Bank, who's a web developer, and um, advanced services as well. So they will assist you with setting up Authorize.net. Authorize.net, by the way, is a Visa company. So um, it's a global company. Um, and rather than going directly to um, the US head office, we have several reseller agencies in Bermuda that, that can assist. Yeah, my process was fairly quick. I just called, you know, called Firemines. Mm -hmm. They connected me with their um, manager of that section of the business. And yeah, I think 24 hours later, you have what you need to flow. Maybe. Absolutely. And also, once your once the authorized.net merchant account is set up, the web developer that you have decided to to use will actually complete the integration, and me and my team will complete the end-to-end -end testing scopes just to make sure authentic authentication, authorization, and settlement processes meet card association card association rules and regulations. Of course, you want to as a merchant, you want to make sure that that seal hits your bank account. So that's where we get involved. Um, I have a question, um, Ricardo. So you mentioned vulnerability scans, and there's one comment um, from um, a, a, an attendee. It says, the most important person on my team is the tech guy. When in doubt, I send to him to verify as well as identify as a spam. It's hard to identify as a spam when looking on my phone. So from a perspective of if you're a business owner and you don't have a dedicated IT team, who can assist in the event of? What are your recommendations for, for our attendees today? Uh, regarding spam filtering, um, when you purchase antivirus, um, some of the antivirus products come with spam filtering as well. So um, there'll be an add-in or something that goes in your Outlook that could uh, assist with that in filtering your email. Kind of harder to do on a mobile device. Um, I would say, if you're checking emails on your mobile and you're not sure about them, I, I would wait until, to go on your computer so you can um, hover over the link properly. Because even I found, um, you know, I have an iPhone. I don't know how it is on Android, what the experience is, but sometimes you try to hover over a link and end up opening it by mistake if you push too hard on the screen or something like that. So I think it's a lot easier um, to do the proper checks that I explained before on your PC using Outlook or, or your email client there. Um, and yeah, spam filtering is a very, very useful um, tool to have. I, I would recommend if you purchase an AV, get one that has um, spam filtering, um, some ransomware controls, um, malware, of course. But yeah, there's, there's some good ones out there. I won't make any particular recommendations, but I tend to look at the reviews online from like, um, don't just go look at reviews anywhere and make sure it's like a PC magazine or something like that, you know, some somewhere that uh, like a tech magazine or something like that will give you the best sort of reviews. Thank you, Ricardo. Uh, we have a question. I would like to ask if bank transfers are okay for payments or it's better if I use credit card payments instead. My business is a pottery business and I will offer delivery services where they pay there. And I'm only aware of bank transfer. Is there any site that we can access for credit card transactions? Andrew, did you wanna address that question regarding bank transfers and other commercial products and services that our local business community can use? Sure. Um, so I think it's important to understand what's the most convenient way of uh, method of payment for your client. Um, because if a wire transfer is going to make it very painful for someone and cost them a lot of money, then you could potentially be losing sales. So to me, it would be a matter of, uh, in that particular situation, a credit card uh, processing uh, 
uh, ability will be uh, will probably be the easiest uh, opportunity for for you know to to grow your client base. Um, but again, I, I guess it really just depends on what you're selling, the amount that you're selling, um, the price point of the item that you're selling, um, and so interest. You know, happy to have a, a detailed conversation relating to that particular um, product if you wish. Thank you, Andrew. Um, and then, Carl, there's some questions regarding the cell phone payment. So I, I think I've addressed that, but we do have a, a, a reader that can be attached to um, a Samsung or Apple phone, um, and then that, that can accept payments for mobile merchants. And we're looking at other technological advancements in payments. Um, so um, keep an eye on our site, um, and we will we provide um, those updates. Uh, we have another question. Are there any other services that Clarion offers for your commercial clients, Andrew? Uh, sure. I mean, there's, uh, you know, we are a full service bank. Um, you know, we do offer deposit accounts, term deposits. Uh, we offer um, corporate credit cards. In fact, our corporate credit cards do offer cash back, um, so half a percent cash back uh, on all purchases. Uh, so that's a, a great benefit on the commercial side. Um, we also offer loans uh, and overdrafts. Um, and again, you know, again, the, the loans and overdraft is, tends to get a little more complicated because it is a little more information that is required. Um, but the, the, the best thing that you can provide to us when it comes to a loan or an overdraft or some form of credit request is a business plan and financial statements. Um, so that would be uh, financial statements for the last three years if they're available. And if not, then financial statements or sorry, projected cash flow statements for the, you know, the next one to two or three years, depending on what le level of credit you're, um, someone is looking for. Um, so again, I guess the main message is we are a full service bank, which for the longest time, um, I know we've been we've been saying that message for the last two or three years uh, because I think uh, historically Clarion uh, has been thought of as a deposit taking bank and that's it, but absolutely not. We are full service um, and uh, happy to engage our you know clients or potential clients to talk about how we can help them in the future. Thank you. And it doesn't look like we have any further questions. Uh, this concludes our presentation today on payments in the new normal. Again, I hope you found this presentation uh, insightful, informative. Uh, thank you so much, Tamara and Carl, from take, for taking the time out of your busy, very busy schedule uh, this week to discuss uh, this uh, particular topic, to provide some guidance and um, and an expertise on how to operate your business under um, un, un, under such unprecedented times. If you'd like to learn more about our Clarion products and services, you can visit our website, www.clarionbank.com. Uh, or if you have any further inquiries on how to set up a merchant or commercial bank account or any other queries, uh, you can email Andrew and his team at commercialbanking at clarionbank.com. If you want to do some retail therapy, purchase some pharmaceutical products, you can always go on peoples.bm and they will deliver or you can pick up. And we have grocery orders. Uh, we have dropit.bm, correct, Carl? Okay. Uh, I don't know how many uh, slots you have available for, for, for deliveries. I know I had to, I know when an announcement was made on Sunday, I had to literally go online really quickly and I was like, I won the lottery when I got a time slot. So I know you're very busy. So you can, um, and you have some availability or I know it's going to be quite busy within the next week, but clients can go on your site um, and right away they're offered, they're given your, your schedule, right? Yeah. Great. All right. Thanks for well, having thanks us. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much guys. All right. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.